Good morning. My name is Brian Kelly. I lead Mercer's Global Workforce Analytics and Planning Practice. And I thought on my plan ride up from Philadelphia today, I could start with a, 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 flip, a flippant remark on the Red Sox. That always scores points in Massachusetts. Uh, I am from Massachusetts, born and raised, went to Boston College. My wife is from Philadelphia, therefore I live in Philadelphia. And I thought it would be easy with the Red Sox, but first we have people that are going to the game. Uh, my children are 10, 8, and 5. Uh, unlike Cindy the Child, they do not work at Fenway Park, although trust me, if I could, they would, right? So I was trying to think that, that the uh, sort of um, uh, synopsis of the presentation today was a recipe for effective workforce planning. And so this is my best tie to the Red Sox. Uh, stick with me here. Right? A recipe for a win against the Yankees uh, for the Red Sox always involves good pitching. So we need Lester to throw about nine innings. We don't want to leave it to the bullpen. So good pitching. Right? We need good defense. Right? So we need Pedroia, Bogarts, everybody to field every ball cleanly, make good throws to first place because Napoli really can't catch anything. So we need good defense. And then we need timely hitting. So we need Big Poppy to come up in the eighth or the ninth inning and do what he does to the Yankees. And so those three things, pitching, defense, and good hitting, timely hitting, should be enough, a recipe, if you will, for success tonight against the Yankees. When you think about strategic workforce planning or you think about how do you project the workforce of the future, right, there's three really key ingredients for this recipe. The first is how do you identify critical talent segments in your organization? Workforce planning is not a budget-driven exercise to understand what headcount is. You want to understand what are the most critical talent segments in your organization. So how do you identify critical talent segments? The second will be how do you model the flow of talent through your organization? It's really difficult to get credibility to talk about projecting the workforce of the future when you don't know how many people work at your organization today and you don't know how your best performers are moving through the organization. Quick show of fans. How many folks have absolute confidence in their headcount number? Okay, congratulations. Everybody else, you'll find a significant amount of value to our discussion today. And then the third will be, how do you go about projecting the workforce of the future? Now that you know your critical talent segments, now you know how they flow through the organization, how do you project into the future? So those three things, not quite pitching, defense, and hitting, but hopefully the recipe for success for workforce planning. Pass the smell test? That worked for everybody? Cool. All right. So we do an awful lot of research at Mercer, and we partnered with the World Economic Forum. This is that event in Davos every year that the CEOs and CFOs and board uh, chairmen or chairwomen go to. And what we found in surveying over 1,000 companies is that 60% of organizations across the globe will increase their spend on workforce planning and on talent this year. 77% of those companies surveyed actually have a workforce plan. 23% do not. And you would think as a service provider, the opportunity for an organization like Mercer is that 23%. Let's have these organizations put in place an effective workforce plan. But when we dug deeper into the data, what we found on the far right is about 76% of those surveyed are not able to quantify the impact of their workforce plans on their organization's performance. Huge disconnect. Organizations want to spend more on talent. Every board is talking about workforce planning, but yet the investments these organizations are making in their workforce plan are not leading to meaningful results, at least not results that they can measure. So the question is, why is this so hard? We'll talk a little bit about that and then give you a couple of tips and tricks as we go through. The first, and we'll look at the numbers on the left-hand side, the first is that strategic workforce planning, the concept of analytics, is very context-dependent. Your business may be going through growth and expansion plans. So you have certain talent challenges there. You may be changing the mix of products that you're bringing to market. You may be entering into new markets. You may be on a cost or efficiency play. Each of these business strategies or where you are in the maturity curve on executing their business strategy plays a key role as to what you will be measuring, what type of talent do you need, and how does the talent you have today project into the future, and do you need completely different teams? It's essentially hitting a moving target. 
If you do not have a solid process in place, it's virtually impossible to hit that moving target. You may be able to do it once, but you will not be able to do it on a repeatable or consistent basis. And fundamentally, workforce planning is a business project. If you work at an organization, or you hear somebody in your organization talk about the project of 2014 for workforce planning, run away. A project has a definitive start and end date. This is a business process. Those organizations, in my experience, have been doing this about 20 years. Those organizations that have it as a project, it will be the binder on your desk somewhere, if people still do binders, right? Um, that nobody really knows what they did in 2014. So that you need to have a solid process. We'll talk a bit about that. I'll share with you that organizations are absolutely investing in this area. I talk to them all the time. We have some data up here from Cedar Crestone as well as from CT Partners about investments that organizations are making in analytics and planning. I'll quickly share two stories, widely different examples, but hopefully it will resonate as to how boards and CEOs are thinking about this. The first is a large manufacturer in the U.S., based in the Midwest, um, not quite a Dow 30 component, but pretty large. And we were in helping them with their workforce planning effort, and we were talking to the CFO, and I said, just stop for a moment. Does this really matter to you? I mean, is this a box that you're going to check as we go through this process? Because if it is, we'll have one conversation. But if this is really important to you, we can dig into it. Help me calibrate here our time together. And the CFO looked at me and said, Kelly? I said, my name's Brian. He said, Kelly? I said, okay, yeah, that sounds good. I can pick up the phone right now and get a billion five from the banks to build a new factory. Capital is cheap. I don't make that phone call because I don't know if I can put the workforce that I need to deliver the economic return from that investment. Wow. Right? So that CFO is talking about capacity and capability. They're not making investments when they can because they don't know they'll have the talent in the future to meet the output demands. That's in the U.S., global manufacturer. Contrast that with about three weeks ago in Jakarta, um, Indonesia. Very interesting conversation with a large motorcycle manufacturer. They have two new lines coming on board. They believe they can put out more output than ever before. They're concerned that they will not pass safety regulations because although they can automate every single process of the assembly, they do not have enough technical degreed engineers for the safety check at the end of the line. They cannot automate that process by government regulation. They're saying we've made the significant investment. Now we don't know how to get the economic return. Two real life stories literally happening right now of organizations making investments without either the proper process or the context to achieve results. So some more data for folks if you're interested in this. Um, the concept of workforce planning or workforce analytic skills, one of the fastest growing positions in the U.S. You can see here the number of open positions that have been now filled, so hires. And on the bottom, you can see this nice color-coded area of where the preponderance of people are being hired. Boston ranks pretty highly. The Mid-Atlantic, D.C., Chicago, San Fran, actually Minneapolis. So people are looking to put these processes in place. What are they doing? The easiest way you can say it is about matching the demand and supply of talent. Right people, right place, right time, right cost. You're balancing a couple of things, value, risk, cost, timing. The difference here is that you're engaging with the business as an HR leadership team to help facilitate this process. This process is going on within your business groups already. You may or may not be aware of that. Business leaders are trying to do this on their own. Advances in technology, advances in processes have allowed us to now do this on a more systematic basis and to scale this across the organization. What's the demand of talent in the future and what type of supply do we have? And do, can we source that demand internally with our talent or do we have to look externally? Right? What's that right balance? I'll pull up for a moment and just say, you should be comfortable with the concept of directionally correct. Strategic workforce planning is not getting that magic eight ball and getting a specific number. We need 7,326 engineers in five years and we need them located in these five locations. I have no clue if that's what you're going to need, nor will you. 
the idea is being directionally correct. You're getting an order of magnitude and identifying risks that the business needs to manage and hopefully mitigate as you move forward in your business operations. Don't spend too much time trying to get that number specific because you don't really know what's going to happen in the future. It's most important that your assumptions are correct. Because what I've learned, I've spent a great deal of time in finance. At the end of every month, finance closes the books. And then what do they do? Audience participation. Anybody? What does finance do? Shout something out. Reforecast. Reforecast, yes. And why do they reforecast? Because the numbers the month before weren't right. You're absolutely correct. Actually, in the U.S., if your numbers are right month after month, quarter after quarter, you now go to jail. Okay? <laughs> you reforecast. The assumptions had to be valid. And that's what we're talking about with workforce planning. So let's dive into it. Right? So the idea of defining critical jobs. Oh, we'll see if this goes. I'll introduce you to a four-box framework. Um, originally put out by the conference board, we've moved some stuff around. On the y-axis, you have scarcity of the skill set. They're hard to find. On the X, criticality of the business. And you see a couple of different buckets. We talk about specialists, non-core, or flexible, core and strategic. If you look up to the top right-hand corner, the strategic segment of your workforce, critical roles, are those portions of the workforce you really should look at engaging with strategic workforce planning. All employees are created equal. But certain employee segments bring a disproportionate amount of value to your business. Focus on them. Okay? This is where you start your workforce planning efforts. Your specialists on the left-hand side, right? you can see scarcity of skill set. It's hard to find them, but the criticality to our business is less important. We can outsource this, contract it. Okay? You may or may not move some roles around. On the far right-hand side, you see core. Really important to your business, but you can find those resources. They're more plentiful. And then non-core. Nobody wants to be labeled non-core. I understand that. Okay? But these are roles that you have to really look at to say, are we spending a disproportionate amount of time trying to weed out those bottom 10%? Or performance managing people in this area when we've already identified what are those most strategic roles in the organization. Right? So this is a framework. I'll give you a couple of examples of a manufacturing firm and the type of roles. It's an eye test. The material will be available post. But what I'll share with you up on the top right-hand side, they look at engineers, and they get into specific types of engineers as the critical roles. A great example of this, 10 years ago, if you went to Detroit and you talked to them about the engineering population that they needed, they had enough mechanical engineers. They needed electrical engineers because they'd be making batteries or cars with batteries in them. They did not have enough EEs. That was their critical role almost 10 years ago. And now you can see they're putting out um, battery-operated cars. Um, the safety and effectiveness lead to a different discussion, okay? Um, and you can model your entire workforce around this area. A couple of key things. One, please don't use names when you go through here. If you say, well, I see this person like Brian and they're a specialist. As soon as you use a name, you lose the objectivity of the process. So keep that in mind as you go through. So first, we want to segment our workforce. We want to find those critical roles. We then want to model the flow of talent through the organization. Here's what we at Mercer call an internal labor market map. If anybody has an HR dashboard or a scorecard or a workforce dashboard, I say throw it out. Use a picture like this. Okay? And that's not a plug for our services. I'll share with you, most people, senior executives, they consume information through a dashboard, don't really look at it. Okay? What they want to understand, and here's what we can show, the yellow is a proxy. The size is, is uh, a proxy for how many people at that level of the organization. Okay? That's the yellow, the Christmas tree in the middle. On the far left-hand side, you can see the level of the organization. You can see how many people that we've hired in. That's the blue arrows. The yellow, again, you can see what's that total employee population on that employee or that talent segment. The green arrows re represent promotions up. You may see some demotions in some of the green arrows. The blue will be laterals, and then you'll see the exits to the organization. I want to see how the talent flows at my company. Picture's worth a thousand words. This is a much better dashboard or picture to use with senior executives because what you do as soon as you see this is what? 
Again, an audience participation. Anybody? You were kind enough to save me before in the middle. What do you do? You come up with hypotheses. You start to solve for this. You say, wow, gosh, I notice that we're losing a lot of people at level three. I'm not quite sure. And then you start to draw pictures. And you start to come up with, here's what might be happening. This is just based on career level. If I overlaid performance, if I overlaid compensation, if I overlaid tenure, if I overlaid diversity, now all of a sudden, this may illuminate some things. One, I didn't know existed at the organization. Or two, what I find is very powerful, it buffs long-term or long-held beliefs within the organization with facts and evidence as opposed to just the gut. I think this might be happening. When you look at your flow of talent, you now know it's a very, very different conversation. So first, we want to look at critical talent segments, define those. The second, we want to use something like this to model the flow of talent. How are those critical talent, or how is that critical talent being brought in? How are they being promoted up, and how are they being moved out? This gives us essentially a current state. Now what you want to be able to do is, based on that future business demand, based on the future business strategy, say, what do we think we need in the future? How many of them? And potentially where? Again, order of magnitude. You can do that in any number of ways. First, HR absolutely should facilitate the process, but HR cannot own the process. The surest recipe for disaster is for HR to come in and say, we're going to own this process now. We'll take it away from you. Right? you. Might as well close up shop. Don't even bother with it. The chances of your success, unless the CEO, he or she absolutely drives this process, will be slim to none. Facilitate it. Gosh, we've invested a lot in technology. Gosh, we can do some of the heavy lifting on the math. We need your input as a business executive to tell us what you think future business demand will look like and model out multiple scenarios. And you can model out scenarios in what I found one of two ways. Again, recognize today I'm spending about 20 minutes trying to get almost 20 years of time into this. So we'll gloss over a couple of things. If you have questions, please do, please do ask. Um, and I had to chuckle as I said that to my wife last night. She goes, wow, what are you going to do with the other 19 minutes, honey? <laughs> Good support, right? Awesome support as we go through. That's what happens when you have a 10, 8, and 5-year-old and travel a lot, right? So I said, well, I do have a couple of things to say. So here's one of them. Project out. This is what we think a demand line will look like and a supply line would look like. In this, it's an inverse relationship. We actually have the supply being greater than the demand. I picked this one purposely. It's counterintuitive. Create multiple scenarios. Again, will you be exact on the numbers? Probably not. The assumptions are what's valid. Right? Now what you're saying here is order of magnitude. We think we have more people than what we're going to need. What do we do differently today? Okay? So that we don't run into this huge gap one, two, three, or four years out. Some organizations like to look at the information this way. Others may like, this is a real eye test here, right? Roles on the left-hand side, and hopefully... Red, green, yellow is intuitive for everybody in the audience. If not, give me a head start as you drive home today. Okay? <laughs> green, you're good. Red, you have some problems. Yellow, I'm not quite sure. We have to investigate. Sometimes business leaders, particularly those in manufacturing and or technology, generally you have more engineers and management positions, want to get into the numbers. So you have to have this level of specificity. You have to figure out what works for your organization as you go forward and start to share, here's what we see the demand, here's what the supply, here's our risk area. Then you can begin the traditional talent management processes to help bridge or minimize some of the risks or gaps. This is the closed loop of the process. It's an ongoing process in that you update these plans as business strategies change or as new data comes in but the ongoing day-to-day -day talent management processes that you have in place absolutely fit into this. I'll close because i got 30, 30, yeah, 29 seconds left. Don't try to do this simply with the existing HR business partner community that you have already. Okay? Try to partner with business line, line leaders, so line of business leaders. The HR business partners that have good relationships, right? generally know the business and can good story 
and supplement that with what we'll call a center of expertise. They don't have to be statisticians or Iowa psychologists. You don't have to hire full-time staff. Borrow from strategic planning. Borrow from finance. Bring them together. And what I'll tell you is you start down this journey, it's really exciting to move to the quantitative side. Don't forget the qualitative. Put the story in the right context so the business leader understands what they're looking at and won't feel threatened. So happy to take any questions. We try to rush right through it. Thank you for your time, and we will say go Red Sox, right? So remember, pitching, defense, and timely hitting is what we need. Critical talent segments, flow of talent, and projected workforce of the future. Thank you for your time.